But once again, and that's not a typo. <laughs> Recording in progress. Yes, I'm going to talk about God's favorite thinks today. Again, welcome to all our guests. You know, good to see Yahweh and everyone here. Really good. That should hang out more often. So don't be strangers. <laughs> You know, God created the human thought process. You ever stop to think about the thought process that we have in our minds? Our, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. For example, everything you see around you in this room, the whole room itself, the whole building, everything is based on an original thought. There was a thought that came about and then action came to make it come to pass. It's amazing to think that everything we see, all the advancements of technology and biology and all the studies, all start with thinking. Someone had a thought, someone had a vision, someone had a plan in their minds, and they were able to propose that plan, get people behind them, get funding, whatever, whatever it takes, right? And boom. Well, even on a smaller scale, you know, if I whip up a batch of food and I serve it, well, everybody's enjoying the food, but I had to think about it and I had to put it together and make it, you know, so on, on that scale, everything we do is based on a thought, a plan. Thinking leads to action. Thinking leads to action. In this world today, like the Bible calls it, the present evil world, mankind's way of thinking leads to destruction. And we know that. I know I'm preaching to the choir about that, but it's, again, we want to focus on that. Because we see that wrong thinking leads to wrong actions. So, if we think sinfully, we act sinfully. And the fruit of those actions will eventually destroy us. You know, Jesus says that if you continue in this, you will perish. The Bible solidly supports the notion that our thoughts truly affect who we are and how we behave. It's all backed up by Scripture throughout the, the Word of God. Now, God wants to change our thought process. He wants to change it. If we're bent toward destruction without God, God is stepping in saying, uh -uh, I want you to change because you keep on your current path, it will destroy you. So he wants to change that. And you know, that's the first step in our conversion. That's the first step in how we receive um, the blessing of God and his relationship with him. Romans 12, verse 2. And every scripture I read is going to be from the New International Version today. Um, the scripture read was a New International. So when we cover that scripture again, we'll be familiar with that. Romans 12, 2 says, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the church at Rome. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, the destructive pattern I just described, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We got that phrase, good, pleasing, perfect will of God. What, what is that? What is God's, ultimately, what is God's good pleasing, and perfect will. It's that we have the mind of Jesus Christ. Everything that we do is guided by how Jesus would do it. You know, what would Jesus do is a cliche, but no, that's how we live. That's how we Christians live. What would Jesus do? Philippians 2, verse 1 to 2, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, verse 2, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. So these are, this is the scriptures both that are telling us that God does want us to have our, to have our minds transformed, to be renewed, okay? Now, our theme this week is the Lord's favor and... We have every week when there is a theme, there are several scriptures associated with that theme. 
And uh, one of them was read today by, by KK. She read our scripture in um, Philippians 4. And I want to be focusing on that as it relates to our theme today. God's favor, which is a theme today, is equated with grace. His grace, His favor, is something He grants to all who repent, to all who follow Him, to all who have surrendered their lives to Him. Okay? So that's God's favor through His grace. One of the greatest manifestations of God's favor is His peace. His peace. A couple of scriptures in John, Jesus is talking to his disciples about peace. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Other scriptures talk about, they say peace, peace, but there is no peace. Because that's the worldly peace. That's peace coming uh, supposedly by worldly terms. Without consultation or influence or inspiration from God. But Jesus says, I don't give you that kind of peace. I give you the kind of peace that really works. So don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And the other scripture in John is in chapter 16, verse 33, which says, I have told you these things. This is Jesus wrapping up a thought. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now why is that? He says, in this world you will have trouble. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are having trouble. Our lives are such that either we've just gotten out of some trouble situation, we're in one, or we're about to be in one. That's our life, right? What does Job say? You know, man is born in trouble, just as surely as sparks fly upward, right? That's what happens. We are, we, we're going to, you know, that's why we love that song, Soon I Will Be Done with the Troubles of the World, going to home and be with God. That's what we're looking for. But Jesus says, I will give you peace throughout all that. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So those are Jesus' promises of peace. There's a connection between God's peace and of the renewing of our minds. There's a connection there. In other words, we receive God's favor when we allow Him to change our way of thinking from the carnal to the spiritual. There's favor when we allow God to do that, that conversion process in our lives, from transforming and renewing our minds. There's also a connection, and I won't dwell a whole lot on this, but when you look at scripture, you can see it evident. There's a connection between the mind and the heart. You know, you know it's not like they're just two separate entities. You think with your mind and you feel with your heart. There are scriptures that talk about a man thinking with his heart. You know, as a man thinks in his heart, so does he. You know, you know that scripture, right? What we think and how we think affects our heart. Um, it works the other way, too. The condition of our heart affects our thinking. They work together. They're, it's like they're inseparable in terms of how they operate and determine how we think, how we believe, how we feel. Okay? Because we act out the condition of our hearts. And we do this through our actions, through the deeds that we have. Our actions and our lives resemble what we think. So, to take responsibility for our thoughts, we must renew our minds and clean up our thinking. Our thinking has to be cleaned up. So that leads us to our scripture today. Our scripture is Philippians 4, verses 4 to 9. Again, in NIV. And uh, I'm going to read it again as part of the message because I'm going to unpack it bit by bit. Um, verse 4, Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be of evidence to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and, all your, and your minds in Christ Jesus. And... Finally, whatever is true, noble, right, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. All right, now, 
Let's look at verses 4 through 7, the one where it starts off talking about rejoicing. Briefly, we can recap this as follows. Verse 4, Paul tells us twice, rejoice. You know, that's a condition of being an extreme demonstrative uh, activity of joy, of thankfulness, of happiness because of whatever situation you're in. And Paul tells us to do that twice. He tells us twice to do that. It's an expression from the heart which is our appreciation and delight for God who has opened our minds to see His goodness. So our minds recognize His goodness and our response to His goodness is, hey, that's for me? Wow. Thank you. Okay. And then you go to verse 5. He tells us, let your moderation be to ancient, let your moderation or gentleness be evident to everyone. So we don't want to go to extremes in our lives. We don't want to be too one way or the other. There's always moderation in how we live. Okay. And we want people to see that. That kind of action is what pleases God. That's why it says the Lord is near. That will be pleasing to Him when He returns. So we want to live in moderation, right? And then verse 6 tells us not to worry. Don't be anxious about anything because we can present all of our cares, all of our concerns before God because God cares and God is concerned. All of us have cares. All of us have concerns. You know, we leave this room today, we're going to be going back to whatever issues we have to face with, whether it's finances, whether it's family, whether it's something physical like health, whether it's social, relationship, whatever. Those are concerns, right? Um, and sometimes our hearts just grieve, even if we're not being touched directly by a lot of these things. Sometimes our hearts grieve because of what others are suffering. You know, God gives us empathy and sympathy to feel for others. And it's enough to keep us groaning and moaning and sighing because these are people just like us, there for the grace of God. We could be there. Like that earthquake in Morocco. We looked on TV and there's places we had just been to are in shambles now. And so it's, God's timing is incredible because, you know, it could have been us. But we're grieving because we fear that people who we know were affected. We don't know if they're still alive. We don't know what their state is. If they're displaced, where are they going to live? You know, there's one picture of this woman groaning by this pile of rubble that used to be her home, you know. And we were in the old town, and that's where a lot of the damage, uh, that's where a lot of the damage in Morocco, in um, Marrakesh, took place. That was not the epicenter. The epicenter suffered even worse, but, Mar but Marrakesh was hit hard. And that could have been us. So we recognize, and we grieve, and we, our prayers are for those who are still there. But God cares, and He is concerned. So, if we are in that situation, we can cast our care on God, knowing that He hasn't brought us to that situation just to drop us and say, okay, I brought you this far, but you can figure out the rest. Fine. He, he's not like that. He's, he's with us from beginning to the end. I am with you always. I will never leave you or forsake you. All these verses about rejoicing, about being in moderation, and about having no cares because we can cast them on God. Those all tie into verse 7, which talks about the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you are always rejoicing in God, living a life of moderation before others, and you're living a worry-free disposition before God, you will experience that peace. You will experience the peace of God flowing through your heart and through your mind. Okay. I like to use that as a jumping point for our focus on verses 8 and 9. That's actually the main focus of my message as far as that scripture is concerned. Let's just recap verse 8 uh, for the third time. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right. I know in the King James it's worded slightly differently, but you get the picture. Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, King James says, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think about such things. Now, if you look at that verse, you'll see that Paul lists six whatevers. Okay? There's true, noble, right, pure, 
lovely and admirable. Six whatevers. I found that some commentaries point out that these are not just random things Paul pulled out of the air and decided to assemble them in one sentence, one paragraph. They're not just individual and unrelated. They actually can be related. They can be categorized. You know, you can take, there's six of them. You can pair them together two by two under specific categories. So let me give you that. The first two, whatever is true, whatever is noble. You know, noble means honest, noble means venerable, what have you. Those two categories, those two, um, yeah, those two traits, as it were, those two things can be under the category of truth. Because you have whatever is true, you have whatever is venerable, noble. That represents truth. What about the next two? Whatsoever is right, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is just and pure. Those can be categorized under righteousness. Righteousness. And finally, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable or of good report, those can be categorized under love. Okay, so you've got the three main categories for these six whatevers. Truth, righteousness, and love. Okay, and then you've got the following, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, if there is anything excellent, or if anything is praiseworthy. Okay, now, what can you do with those? Virtue can sum up the first four whatevers. If virtue sums up whatever is true, noble, right, and pure. So it sums up truth and righteousness. That's virtue. And then praise, it sums up the last two whatevers. You know, what is ever lovely and admirable or, or good report. It sums up the love. It's praiseworthy when you have love. So those are categories that can help us kind of see that verse in more of a, oh, okay, this verse makes sense. You know, it actually has a, a a deeper message than just six or seven or eight whatevers, right? It actually has, it actually makes sense. Now, Paul says all these things, but then what does he do? He says, what do you do with this? What, what, what are you supposed to do with these things? He says, think about these things. Think on these things. Okay? Colossians 3, 1 to 2 talks about that even more. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So you see Paul joins the heart and the mind in Colossians, talking and telling us to set them not on the carnal, not on the earthly, but set them on the heavenly, the eternal, where Jesus is. He says elsewhere, we're seated at the right hand with Him, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ, well, that's where our thoughts should be. Our thoughts should not be any more tempered by the world, whatsoever things of the world, you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Leave those alone. Leave those behind. So, all these wonderful things that we must set our minds on and our hearts on, at the same time, we need to watch out for the opposites and refrain from those. You know, whatsoever things are untrue, foolish, unjust, contaminated, Despicable, scandalous. Now, come on. None of those make good for good TV. The TV is based on all of these things, especially some of these soap operas, right? Some of these shows that turn into soap operas after a while. You know, especially scandal. It's like, oh, who's doing this with that? No, you know, so and so is this all this intrigue, you know, and you stretch it out over ten episodes just to get to the story, you know. Movies are like that. It's like they're glorifying those negative traits. Okay? Our minds are glued into those. It's like this is... You have people that are really... They search for that, you know? That's why the world's going to perish. Without a change in thinking, that's exactly the destiny of the world. That's why we must rid ourselves of those things. The lustful things. The lewd things. The impure things. The gossipy things. And also the trivial ways of thinking, you know, where you don't stop and you really think about these deep things, you know. You just care about, you know, is there enough salt on my pizza, you know, and you're upset if it's not. You know, the trivial things that 
people fired about. You know, was it, what was it recently? Uh, somebody got shot over a bag of chips. Mm. You know, two kids got in a fight and one shot the other because, you know, these things that, <laughs> you know, they grieve God because there's so much more that we could have. There's so much more that there is to life. There's so much more that there is. And the things that are eternal are what really matters. The scripture says that all these things <clears throat> of the world will pass away. They'll be gone. But whatever, whoever holds on to God abides forever. So we must get rid of all these lewd things, lustful, impure, gossipy, and whatnot. And instead, let's focus on right thinking, okay? And that's what these scriptures are telling us. Think on these lovely things, these wonderful things. Now there's one important point, one more important point that kind of puts this all together. You see, all of these good things mentioned in this scripture, whatsoever's and let there be virtue praise, they are all wonderful and takes a lifetime to really pursue as we pursue godliness. But ultimately they are greater than what they first appear. You know, I mentioned they're not just random words, they can be categorized. However, it's not just about things only. All of these things point to, all of these things describe, and all of these things embody a person, Jesus Christ. Truth, righteousness, and love are all wrapped up in Jesus. He is a sum total of all things virtuous and all things praiseworthy. So if we link ourselves to Him by faith and love, and if we take Him into our hearts and minds, and if we abide in Him, like John says, abide in the vine, you know, where the branches abide in Him, and we will bear much fruit. If we do that, we have all these good things gathered together in Him. We have those gathered in Him. So, thinking on these things is not just meditation on abstractions, you know, when we sit there and our legs are crossed and we're thinking true, pure, lovely. Okay, what's on TV? It's not like that. It's not just meditating on that. It's more than that. It's internalizing it and grasping onto it and living it. We're living in, with, and by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If Christ is in our thoughts, all good things are there as well. Now, as mentioned earlier, Thinking leads to actions. We've all experienced that. We know. We think something, boom. We do it, boom. There it is. So, what does Paul admonish us in verse 9 after we think on these things, after we think about such things? He says in verse 9, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, Paul said, okay, you're thinking on these things, you're meditating on them, you're cogitating them, you know, you're turning them over in your heart and your mind. Do the next step, follow the next progression from your thinking, and that is, act on them. Now, what you see Paul doing in the beginning of verse 9, is he's using himself as an example. Whatever you've learned, received, or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice. So, he's confident that he's following and practicing what he preaches. Okay, and so he says, if you see, as you've seen me do it, do likewise. Put it into practice. Another scripture says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's kind of what he's saying here. And he says, at the end of it all, what is the result? The God of peace will be with you. God will grant you his favor in the blessing of his peace. How many of you really stop to think about how great peace of mind is? It is great. That way, so no, whatever you focus on, whatever is your problem, whatever hits you, yeah, you'll be concerned. You might say, okay, you might grieve if it's, a, if it's a tragedy, whatever. But the overall peace of mind that God gives you helps you cope with it. It helps you grow from it. It helps you learn from it. It helps you move forward to the next step and stage in your growth, in your walk with Christ. Peace exists in the mind and heart. That's where peace dwells, you know. So where there is no peace, there's trouble in both your mind and your heart. That's why peace of mind is so important. 
But Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, has come to favor you with the peace that He alone can give. Because He's the way, the truth, and the life, so everything He gives you is true. Don't listen to the lies of the devil saying, I can give you peace if you do this or that. No, that's a lie. Only God can give you true peace, true, lasting, permanent peace. So let's examine our thinking. Let's put away all the thoughts that are carnal, earthy, and in opposition to the perfect will of God. In their place, let's rejoice greatly. Let's give expression to our joy and thanksgiving in the Lord. Let us live moderately and free ourselves from anxiety and worry in the sight of God. And let us think on all those things that reveal the character of Jesus Christ living in us. If you do all of this, God's peace will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. 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 Amen.